Hello everyone, today we're going to look at how to play Mongoose's Victory at Sea Naval Miniatures game in Tabletop Sim. Uh, before I get begin and uh, kind of get rolling with the actual rules and kind of how to do this, um, quick thing, this is basically I removed the table and I took a custom game board, slapped on an image from Google Earth that looks kind of like water. This is kind of neat if you have like a sea action that actually takes place and you can put islands in and make your own custom graphics for this. But I suggest, you know, do whatever works pretty well for you. So anyway, um, what is Victory at Sea? Victory at Sea is a set of naval miniature wargaming rules that that enables you to reenact a bunch of different battles throughout, especially World War II, World War I. There are some modern rules, but they don't apply to this particular game, this particular setting. So uh, as you probably saw in the live action version of this, um, I've got the same exact setup. Over here I have a Brooklyn class cruiser, and over here I have a Victory class cargo ship. Um, even though normally this would be on the same side, we're going to use them as antagonists just to kind of demonstrate some of the different features of this game. So anyway, the games are relatively easy to do. Uh, first thing you're going to do is roll initiative, then you're going to have a movement phase, then you're going to have an attack phase, then finally you get this end phase, kind of a cleanup phase. So starting at the beginning, we have the initiative phase. Initiative phase is real easy. Each player takes two die six and rolls it. Whoop, throw that one over there, throw that one over there. So in this case, it gave us a nine for the American Brooklyn, and it gave us a seven over here for our victory. Uh, keep in mind this is by side usually, not by ship. Um, normally, we'd say, well, this guy got a 9, and this guy got a 7. This guy gets to decide who moves first. This ship, let's say it had a rule that looks something closer to like this. In this case, the civilian ship would be going first, or get to decide who moves first, I should say. But since it is a civil ship, you have to subtract 1 from that roll. And since it's the only ship left, and the only ship left is a civilian ship, you have to take another 1 off that roll, meaning his roll was actually a 10, which is still enough. Once you've determined initiative, initiative has a lot of effects, as you'll see in a minute. Uh, we move on to the movement phase. At the beginning of the movement phase, you have the option to take any special actions during a turn. Special actions are basically little things that, um, you know, concentrate firepower, move flank speed, lay smoke, things along those lines. Those are all featured inside the chapter itself. In my particular case, I'm going to try for a flank speed action on the Brooklyn class cruiser. Oh, by the way, during the movement phase, the person who won initiative decides who gets to move first. Once he's moved a ship, or the other person has moved a ship, then you alternate who moves ships. If you have a situation where one side has more ships than the other, usually those extra ships move after everybody else is gone. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and uh, take a look at our little book here. I've got this out right in front of me, in case you're following along. And I'm going to scoot all the way down to the section where it gives you the opportunities for special actions. Again, one of the great things about this system is the fact everything is so simple and it's all concentrated. So to use flank speed, the command check is automatic, which means I can now add one half of my normal top speed to my normal speed. Another really, really cool thing you can do is you can do what they call come about, which adds one to your turning score, which again is pretty useful depending on the situation. Situation. Uh, when you are moving flank speed, by the way, you suffer a minus one penalty. So you know what? I renege on that. All right, this guy won initiative, so he's going to choose who goes first. I'm going to say the victory's got to go first. The victory, of course, is a civilian. And uh, looking at the traits inside the book, he only has a speed of one. So there's a couple different ways you can do this. First of all, we can take from the front edge, measure one, go ahead and click. This is using F5 in the ruler tool. And we can go ahead and move him like that. The other option we can do is we can go grab a virtual ruler, something along these lines. This is much more in line with what they normally would do on a table, usually with a tape measure. Go ahead and move them up an inch, and then go ahead and um, pull this out of the way. It's up to you. Now, when you're moving, you have the option to rotate, I should say, turn the ship. Now, turning the ship is a little complicated, and it's completely dependent on the specific ship that you're using. This ship has a speed of 7, and it has a turn of 2. So what we do is we go and grab the little turn indicator right here, and now what we can do is we can move him and then actually turn him. You have to move the ship at least half of your speed in order to start turning. So in this particular case, half of his speed of 7 is 3.5. So if I just were to go ahead and mark out three and a half real quick, move them over. I can now get the speed of a jig. Now, the thing with this ship is, I'm going to go ahead and actually lock this because it makes it a little easier to rotate this guy under it. What's going to happen here is that we can move up to the number, whatever the turning number is on this ship. The turning number in this specific ship is two, which means we can move up to two of these notches. So I'll go ahead and move my first one. I'll go ahead and move my second one. Now I can finish up my turn. By the way, I lock that. 
Uh, we can go the other three and a half and go ahead and stop. Had I gone flank speed, I could have gone up to 10, but again, that would have hurt my gunnery rolls, so I'm glad that I didn't. And then you have the basics of movement. That's really all there is to it. Submarines and airplanes kind of have their own little rules, but we're going to leave that for another day. So anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and reset him, park him right here to cross his T perfectly, and then we're going to move on to the next phase, which is the attack phase. Now, the attack phase in Victory at Sea goes really, really quickly, which I think is really to the credit of the game designers. You know, I find that it does not take long at all to execute these things, and it also tends to use a dice that you tend to have sitting around quite a bit, which is the uh, D6 dice, which I have over there on my left. So the ship we're simulating here is a Brooklyn-class cruiser. A Brooklyn-class cruiser, I believe, is extremely well-armed, if I recall correctly. Yes, yes it is. Oh, wow. Yes, it is. It is an A turret, B turret, Q turret, X turret, and a Y turret, which is a significant amount of firepower. Now, when you're declaring attacks, you're not allowed to pre-measure. You have to do all that by eye. In this program, it's pretty much impossible to stop somebody from going like that. But in uh, normal tabletop, you can actually work that out directly. So anyway, so the Brooklyn class cruiser is going to attack this guy with this main armament. Now, in the event that there were two of these guys, you are not allowed to split fire of your main armament. Your main armament must concentrate on a single target. And, this is important, if you have secondary armament, there is no restriction as far as where you fire your guns. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and grab my little template here, which helps me out to determine if I'm in range here. It seems I'm completely in the port arc, so I am good to go. So taking a look at my little diagram here, let's see here. I have one, two, three, four, five individual turrets, and they can all come out the port arc. That is a lot, not even including my secondary turrets. Now, in this particular cruiser, I get an attack dice of one dice per turret turret, which would mean, since there's five turrets firing, I get a total of five dice. Now, there's a couple other little kind of quirks, I guess I would say, with this ship. There's a special trait called Twin Linked, which means I can re-roll any of the dice that I'm not happy with. It's kind of interesting how that works. So, I'm going to go ahead and take this, give it a shake. Um, by the way, modifiers to this roll. Go ahead and roll that real quick. If the ship is pointing at me directly and he's less than 20 inches away, he gets to roll basically standard. So the number I'd be looking for is what they call the target number on the ship. It's not his target number, it's his target number. The target number on the Victory class cargo ship in this particular story is 4, which means any of these that are 4 or higher in a standard shot would count as a hit, and we get to roll a damage dice for it. The interesting thing here is, if I were in this situation, I would actually get to add one to each one of these, I should say, um, add one to each one of these die rolls because I'm getting the broadside of the beam of the target that I'm attacking. But again, in this case, I'm going to go ahead and keep it simple. So I have one, two, three, four, five hits. Now each one of these hits gets a certain number of damage dice. In this case, because I'm using a six inch gun, I get one damage dice per hit. Since it's five hits, I get five damage dice. Now what you do is you roll the damage dice and you compare the number on the damage dice with the armor value of the ship. There's a couple things that modify that. If you're firing at long or extreme range, you get to add one. If um, you're in a situation where you have AP ammunition, you get to add one. If you have super AP ammunition, you can actually add two to this roll. By the way, once in a while, you're going to get a target number of seven, which means you can't possibly hit that target. That's an interesting problem, but we'll deal with that a little later. So anyway, so the armor rating on this guy is a two plus. Since I am uh, hitting him normally, I'm not at long range, it's going to be just a normal two plus to do damage, which gives me one, two, three individual shots that actually connected and did enough damage to actually matter. That means this Victory class cargo ship has only got, let's see, it starts with 7, minus 3, 4 hit points left. If my damage pushed him past his crippled threshold, things get a little bit more complicated. You would have to roll to see if any of his special traits were disabled. You'd have to roll to see if um, any of his guns got disabled. And you would also lose half of his speed, which isn't very fast to begin with. And um, it would be very, very difficult for him to continue operating on a normal basis. But we're going to leave that alone for now. So he'd be left with four hit points, which is actually pretty good. Now, let's say that when I roll my damage dice, it's never going to happen. Oh, look at that. I did not plan that, but that's awesome. Let's say I roll my damage dice and it gives me a six. That means there's a possibility of a critical hit. We just take that and we need a four up in order to count it. Perfect. So now we get to roll in the critical hit chart. To do a critical hit, it's very, very simple. You're just going to grab two die six and go ahead and roll it. So in this case, we got a four and a four, which gives us an eight 
We then cross-reference that value of an 8 with a critical hit chart, which in this case would be the engines. So now we take another die 6 and roll it on the engine chart to see what actually got damaged. 5. So in this case, it says the fuel systems are ruptured. So we increase the damage from that hit. Just that hit, though. So we'd have three damage on that particular hit, plus the other two damage. That's five damage. That actually cripples the ship. It also says it does two crew damage. Now, the interesting thing here is because this ship is crewed with only two, that doesn't mean two people, um, that would mean the ship has no crew left, so it can no longer perform actions. And then finally it says um, there's minus three speed, which the speed was one, so minus three is two, and a fire starts. Now in the event that you have a fire, it's probably a pretty good idea to go ahead and get yourself some kind of special custom token that you can use to represent he's on fire, or if you're keeping track of... Um, these sorts of things on a character sheet, and a character sheet, a vehicle sheet, you can go ahead and do that. Also, since this is the universe of tabletop sim, you can come over here and do something like that. Now you can represent like that, that he's on fire. Again, you're going to decide which one of these methods works best for you. I think that's pretty dramatic, so I'm actually going to leave him burning like that. We'll deal with the fire in a minute. So um, if a ship has secondary armament, keep in mind, this is just from the first shots that we did. If a ship has secondary armament, you can target anyone, you can split your fire, and you can actually fire it in every single direction without any penalty. Now this particular ship has two die for secondary armament. So again, we're trying to hit on a four up, which we do get, which means he gets another die on a two up. That's a six, another possible critical. Wow, this is just not this guy's day. Another thing I want to point out, too, is the main guns on this, and I forgot to mention this a moment ago, have a special characteristic called weak. That means that on damage die, you have to subtract one from the die. So normally it would be a two cause damage. That would actually count itself as a one and cause no damage to the particular victory class ship. So um, what if we have torpedoes? So I'm going to go ahead and swap this guy out for a Fletcher class torpedo, a destroyer rather. I'm going to go ahead and park him right here. Torpedoes, of course, can only, in this particular destroyer, can only fire out of the bow and but the bow. If it was a submarine, it could fire out of the bow, the port and the starboard side. It's really important to keep track of which way is pointing what. In this particular case, which way are we pointing? Yeah, we're pointing this way. That's fine. So torpedoes are handled a little differently. You fire a torpedo at the beginning of the guns phase. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my torpedo. To represent a torpedo attack, we simply measure the range to check it. Six, that's within ten. And then we go ahead and put the torpedo marker next to the target we're firing a torpedo at. That's it. Now, at the end of the guns phase, or I should say the attack phase, then we actually roll to see if the torpedo was successful. When you're firing torpedoes, there's no long range modifier. The only real modifier here is if you're attacking the beam or you're attacking the bow or the stern of the ship. In this case, we took a beam shot. To roll for torpedo attacks, uh, this particular ship gets five attack dice. Now, the only thing modifying this, remember, is the fact we're doing a beam attack. So the hit on this guy would be a four. We're doing a beam attack, which actually brings it to a three. So one, two, three, four. Wow. So four individual hits with that torpedo. That could either represent one torpedo doing an amazing shot or four torpedoes with individual shots. Now, for each torpedo that hit, you have to now roll, uh, specific to this particular vehicle, five dice to see how much damage it does. So this is for the first hit. One, two, three, possible two criticals. Two criticals, and then you'd have to roll it again. Then you'd have to roll it again. Then we'd have to roll it again. So without doing the math quickly, that looks something like 14, 15 damage plus three critical hits. Um, safe to say the victory class is not coming back from that. Now, if it was the Bismarck, might be a different story. Now, let's say that all this happened, and somehow our victory, which is at minus like 20 hit points at this point, say our victory ship is uh, still going. I'd be impressed. But um, we get to the end phase, finally. The end phase is when you do all damage control. Damage control is pretty straightforward in this game. If you have a critical hit, not a vital hit, you can roll to fix it. So in this case, if you remember, a little while ago, we got a fuel system rupture hit. So to fix that, what we need to do is we need to take a die six, and we need to add the ship's command score. The ship's command score is something you come up with when you're first building the ship itself. Generally, that number is four. It can be as low as two. I'm sure you can have a one, but since this is a merchant, I'm going to say three. Okay, so three plus two is five. If 
we were able to get a number of a nine or more, we'd be able to fix that damage to our, in our fuel lines, which we were not able to, unfortunately. Remember, you can't bring back dead crew, by the way. So this, this is bad news. This is bad news. So what about that fire? So to fix the fire, we have to roll against each fire that our ship has. Now, in this case, it's going to be a D6 plus our crew. Again, remember, it's plus three. So we got a six, so that means a nine, which means for um, every one of the fires, we get to, um, for each fire that we roll for, we can put out a fire if we get a seven or better. In this case, we got a nine, so that actually removes that fire. I'm going to go like the water on fire for some reason. Nah, I just delete it. It's fine. Which would mean the fire goes out. Now, if the fire was not put out, the ship would take two crew people damage. Now, remember, the ship only has a crew of two, which would mean the ship has run out of people to run the ship at that point, and it's just a drift. Now, a lot of people do the best they can to try to keep that information secret from their partner to like say, oh, the ship's still there, but why didn't it move? You know, just to kind of keep things interesting. So that's the basics of playing Victory at Sea using Tabletop Sim. Uh, there's other elements to this game, such as submarines and airplanes, but we're going to cover that on a different day. There's also extra bonus expanded rules. Now, one last thing I'm going to leave you guys with. If you remember a little while ago, I mentioned the fact that if you run into a situation where you add up all the bonuses and penalties, and you end up with a uh, 7 for the attack, you'll notice that a 6 can't get to 7. If that happens, you can't actually damage the vehicle you're shooting at. My favorite example of this, of course, is this scenario, where the uh, Fletcher-class destroyer, if it moves 6 inches or more, gets plus 1 to hit, but it's already at a plus 6 to hit, which would mean if this particular destroyer were to move, let's say, 7 inches, it now has a target number of 7, which means the Brooklyn is unable to actually hit the destroyer. This, of course, would be different if it did 7 like this, because at least you get the plus 1 because you're hitting his beam again, which is fairly useful. Um, another thing I want to add, too, is if you're in a situation where you're more than 20 inches apart from the target you're attacking, this particular case, then you're at long range, and you have to add 1 to your roll. So for this particular guy, for remember, he had uh, 5 attack dice. Hitting a destroyer is a 6, but since we're at long range, it becomes a 7, which makes this impossible. But he is giving us his broadside, which means we get to go back to a 6. So this is going to be pretty unlikely. Yeah, exactly as we expected. So unfortunately, that was a no hit on that particular character. In the event that you did hit, you always get to add one to your damage dice. That doesn't mean you get to add an extra damage dice. That just means you add one to the roll because of the plunging fire. If I were to flip this to the side, for example, when these things are firing, they're doing something kind of like my finger versus these flat shots that come in like that at shorter range. So um, also, if a guy finds himself all the way out of this distance, this is extreme range because it's greater than 30 inches, you have to actually add two tier to hit roll, which again, for Mr. Destroyer, in any situation, he's impossible to hit. So that's the basics of uh, Victory at Sea for Mongoose. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you have any questions, toss them in the comments. Any corrections, I'll try to throw in some annotations. Enjoy.